So in this video, I'd like to continue talking about flame, and this time I'd like to focus specifically on how flame spreads. Uh, so to begin with, flame would be characterized in today's parlance as a trojan. Um, in contrast, it, it's not like your traditional file infector or parasitic infectors. It's a standalone uh, piece of malware. It, it actually is a, is a set of files, but it operates in a standalone fashion. It's also uh, got backdoor capabilities. In other words, it opens up an avenue for the uh, bot master or the controller to go and uh, connect to any system that has been infected by flame. And then finally, uh, Flame also serves uh, basically as kind of like worm-like features, and it actually does spread uh, in a very similar manner to the way a worm might spread. So it, it kind of looks for uh, local hosts that it can infect. And, and let me talk a bit about the different mechanisms by which uh, uh, this worm-like behavior can take place in Flame. Uh, so first of all, uh, Flame can spread over the, uh, the local network. So local network. Okay, and specifically, um, the way it actually can spread over the local network is it can take advantage of a number of exploits. So uh, the, the, the main ones are, I think, MS1061. Uh, which is a, uh, a, a print spooler vulnerability. The other one that appears to be uh, inside of Flame is uh, MS1046. Uh, this is also known as Inc. Uh, and so, you know, these are actually interesting because they were both, uh, in particular, these were both used by Stuxnet. So. Uh, that goes to show that Stuxnet and Flame have these very similar characteristics. Um, even though they are different in many ways, uh, it seems pretty clear that the attackers, the guys who wrote Flame, seem to have access to some of the same knowledge that the team that wrote Stuxnet had access to. And so that suggests uh, to some degree development by a parallel team, but perhaps an independent team. Okay. Um, the, the other thing is, is that uh, Flame can also spread. The other way it can spread is by... Uh, what happens if, if Flame actually is, is launched by somebody who has uh, domain controller privileges? So in particular, um, if the uh, person who's been infected has uh, admin rights uh, to the domain controller, then uh, Flame can spread that way as well. And in, in particular, um, you know, what will happen is it'll, it'll create backdoors on those systems and then transmit information or infect itself onto those systems after it's created backdoors. And these backdoors are basically created with a known password to facilitate that type of, uh, that type of copy. Now, aside from the local network, and I guess you can think of, I mean, this, these are kind of domain controllers where they're kind of part of spreading over the local network. Aside from spreading over the local network, Flame can also spread over uh, removable media, so removable media. And obviously the classic example here uh, is the USB drive. Uh, and in particular, uh, really, Flame takes advantage of, of notions like auto run to uh, to spread over USB drives. And, and auto run is where something that gets plugged in will, will kind of automatically run, uh, you know, w without the user interfering or in intervening in that process. Now, you know, despite the these different mechanisms, these different kind of worm-like mechanisms that are that are fairly robust and that Flame uses to actually spread itself. What's interesting about Flame in particular is that it actually tries to control its own spread. Uh, and so, for example, uh, what does it do to do that? Well, one, one thing it can do is it, let me kind of write that down, control spread. I think it's worth noting that uh, it's not trying to spread rampantly, but controlled spread. And one mechanism it uses is, some, is something called a mutex. Uh, and a mutex, it's, it's a really old notion in parallel programming, specifically actually in concurrent programming. It stands for mutual exclusion. A uh, very common technique that limits the number, in this case, in the case of uh, Flame, it'll limit the number of running instances on the same system. And in particular, it's going to limit it to one. Because if you had, uh, let's say, multiple instances of a piece of malware running on a system, that might make the malware noisy and much easier to notice, a much more um, noisy threat. And so as a result, uh, because Flame does not want to be caught, it, it's, it's going to do things that stay under the radar. It also has other throttles that are built in, and, and also the bot master in particular can control the spread of the threat through various configuration options. And, and so these characteristics to me uh, point to the likelihood that Flame 
really is a cyber weapon. Since a cyber criminal wouldn't want to, a, a traditional cyber criminal at least wouldn't want to limit the spread of any threat. I mean, they want to kind of get on as many systems as possible. Clearly, the authors of Flame, the people who designed this threat, wanted it to be targeted, only wanted to hit a very specific number of machines. And so we're trying to limit the scope of spread, uh, which again points to the notion that it is more of a cyber weapon than really a cyber criminal tool. So what I'll do is I'm going to stop right here, uh, and I'll do another follow-on video where I'll talk specifically about the underlying characteristics of the Flame architecture. Hope you enjoyed this video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thanks a lot.